Matilda told such dreadful lies, it made one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Her aunt, who from her earliest youth had kept a strict regard for truth, attempted to believe Matilda. That was my dad. A rare recording that Robbie made ten years ago when dad was in Highgate nursing home. So not at the peak of his powers as an actor but it still moves me. Dad was a very accomplished and cultured man for a GP. He was artistic. He had a beautiful speaking and singing voice. He played the piano, the flute, he painted watercolours and he sketched. And I like to think that I inherited his love of the arts, his eye and his ear. It was Dad who taught me the magic of storytelling. When he read Nicholas Nickleby to me as a child and my bedroom was filled with a cast of characters and voices, that's where my love of Dickens began and my understanding that it needs to be read out loud. When I came to Spain 24 years ago, I got the chance to elbow my way into the world of theatre. First as a trained uh, makeup and hair artist, then as an actress, voice actor, I did a little bit of writing, directing, producing. And one of my proudest pieces was when we staged a reading of extracts from Dickens to commemorate the great man's 200th birthday on the 7th of February 2012 in a little old world tavern in the centre of Madrid, Taberna Elisa which was, incidentally, where the Americana Music Jam Madrid was born. And so successful was it that we were invited to perform in the Athenaeum Club of Madrid. That's the Athenaeum. And curiously enough, the 19th of May was the very same day that three years later my father died. So this extract that I'm going to read for you now has a special place in my heart and my memories of my father. June is his month, the 22nd, his birthday. Last Monday, he would have been 92 years old and he never got to hear me do this. This comes from a story that you will probably all know very well, but perhaps not this particular extract, which speaks to me of the importance of valuing life's smaller moments and more particularly, of not leaving what we need to say unsaid. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, Scrooge cried out in great excitement. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen, looked up at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven, rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence and called out, yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow prentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say Jack Robinson. And you wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. 
They charged into the street with the shutters, one, two, three, and came back before you got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hello, <laughs> cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick! Cheer up, Ebenezer! Clear away! Clear away? There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it in tune like fifty stomach aches. And in came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. And in came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. And in came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. And in came all the young men and women employed in the business. The housemaid with her cousin, the baker. The cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came and away they all went. Twenty couples at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place and new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. And when this result was brought about, old Fezziwig clapping his hands to stop the dance cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter especially provided for that purpose. But scorning the rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter and he were a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances and there were forfeits and more dances and there was a cake and a great piece of cold roast and a great piece of cold boiled and mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and the boiled when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley and then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs Fezziwig. Top couple, too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out from three or four and twenty pair of partners. But if they'd been twice as many, or oh, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons and you couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs Fezziwig had gone through all the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. And when the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr and Mrs Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a very Christmas, very Christmas. And when everybody had retired but the two prentices, they did the same to them. And thus the cheerful voices died away and the lads were left to their beds which were under a counter in the back shop. And during the whole of this time Scrooge acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self he corroborated everything and remembered remembered everything and enjoyed everything and underwent the strangest agitation. 
and it was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him while the light upon its head burned very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed him to listen to the two prentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwick, and when he'd done so, said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks and things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up and what then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Nothing in particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. One of those moments in life that nearly passed me by, but didn't, thanks to someone else who has an important role tonight, is when I first met Donald Thompson at the Taller de Favetha in Los Molinos, where Robbie and Nick have performed for the last five years on Thursday nights with the Potato Monsters. Because my dear friend, Tessa Estevez, was sitting next to me and she leaned over and whispered, I think I know that guy. I think I performed with him years ago. And it took her a little bit of encouraging, but eventually she did go over and say hello. And from thence, a new friendship was born. So we haven't actually known each other all that long. But I feel as if I've known Donal for many years. He's a man very much like my dad, in that he's a very accomplished and well-rounded man of the arts. He's a teacher of great experience. I've known him as a singer and musician on stage at the Taillere. I never actually saw him perform his own shows, The Poet's Arms, in Madrid with Tessa, Ava Messinger and Amy Jo Doherty. But I've since discovered for myself his extraordinary talent as a writer and poet. His poetry again begs to be read out loud for its wit and its rhythm and its wry understanding of the modern human condition. And since he gave me a copy of his book, Internal Combustion, I felt that it really was a no-brainer that I should read some this evening. Internal Combustion is bursting with poetic gems. I've chosen only five short pieces to read in all, and I won't read them all together, uh, which I think reflect what makes me smile about Donald's take on life and love, and also speak to me very personally about my relationships with my husband, Robbie, and with my dad and his art. I've also attached a link to Donald's book on sale on Amazon, 
with this post, so please do go and look for that. From the collection Internal Combustion by Donald Thompson. The Oracle of My Weaknesses. I ate herbs for you and became a man for all your seasonings. <laughs> you showed me the Mediterranean method of shouting light into love. You are the oracle of my weaknesses. Knowing where I'm ticklish, fickle and vain. One word between us can be a conference, a confidence, a call for help or a joke. You toss stones ahead of me into tempting groves and reveal minefields in intended intimacies. I feel at home with you, not armchaired and slippered, but pushed and free. I always have time for you. Truth is your oxygen and old masters your joy. Your sketch pads bulge with the pencil muscles of shaded life-drawn limbs. You're strong. You reject convenient barricades. Yet a careless word or world can leave you nursing a perfect vulnerability. You're my best friend. You know me. Inside, out, creased, ironed, clean and drunk. You walked into the godless vacuum with me. And you led me out. Ish. Is and not is, is ish. Iberian autumns, Spanish springs, they are never what you wish for, these things. The fake nicotine stain on the ceiling of smoke-free bars. Unloved mongrels subwoofing pain from their cars. The virgin hook awaiting its fish. Lamia halfway to a bat. The feline apotheosis of Ish. Schrodinger's cat. Some flowers grow higher than others. One bird is mute, another sings. Girls outgrow their mothers. It is the nature of things. Everything is in a halfway state. No point that isn't a middle position. Because even the full stop of fate is just a comma before decomposition. The newly promoted. All the forgotten principles of the newly promoted put me in mind of the smug bastard at the bus stop who, on being asked, uh, is this the end of the queue? Answers, not now, it's not. I think the theme of the newly promoted has a little bit to do with my next piece. Miss Fozard Finds Her Feet is one of Alan Bennett's Talking Heads monologues, a series he created in 1988 to help BBC Two in a time of crisis. And they were so successful that I would say they are now considered a cornerstone of our literary heritage. Patricia Routledge performed this in the original recordings and for me, she delivers all the poignancy and delicate humour of Bennett's Joycean stream of consciousness. I originally prepared this extract as an audition piece, which I never gave, with the help of a friend and colleague, Thisbe Burns, who incidentally was one of our cast of performers for our Dickens readings and who also put on her own magnificent production of a selection of Talking Heads monologues here in Madrid a few years ago. So I would say that this piece ties up a lot of ends for me. Soft furnishings. 
We're always a bit slack first thing, so I'll generally do a little wander over into floor coverings and have a word with Estelle Metcalf. Estelle's all right, but she's a bit on the young side. Big glasses. Boyfriend's one of these who dress up as cavaliers at the weekend. And I said to her this morning, Shiatsu. She said, come again. I said, Shiatsu, what is it? She said, is it a tropical fish? I said, no. She said, is it a mushroom? I said, no. She said, is it Mr Dunderdale? I said, why should it be Mr Dunderdale? She said, because most things are with you these days. I said, I shall ignore that, Estelle. Suffice it to say, it's a form of massage involving various pressure points on the body that was invented by the Japanese. And she said, well, that's all very well, but it didn't stop them doing Pearl Harbour, did it? Neville's besieging York this Sunday, trying out his new breastplate. Just then a customer comes in, wanting some seersucker slipovers, so we had to cut it short. I don't talk about Mr Dunderdale. I go weekly now, though Mr Dunderdale won't charge me any more. I was sat on the sofa afterwards while he put away his instruments and he said, Good news, Miss Fozard. We seem to have cracked the Tinea pedis. Not a trace of it left. I think that calls for a sherry refill. Are you in a hurry to get off? I said, no, why? He said, I wonder if I might prevail upon you to try on a pair of booties. I said, booties? He said, well, I'm using the term loosely. Technically, they're a fur-lined Gibson, bruised look, but booties is a convenient shorthand. The shade... His Bengal bronze. I said, well, they're a lovely shoe. He said, yes. Cosy. Ankle hugging. They make a beautiful ending to the leg. They're a present, of course. I said, oh, Mr Dunderdale, I couldn't. He said, Miss Fossard, please. And besides... There's a little something you can do for me in return. I said, oh, he said, my years in bending over ladies' feet have resulted in an intermittently painful lower back, which, if you are amenable, you have it in your power to alleviate. I said, I do, Mr Dunderdale. He said, you do, Miss Fossard. I am going to put... One cushion on the hearthrug here for my head and the other here for my abdomen. And now I'm going to lie down and what I want you to do is to step on my lower back. I said, should I take the booties off? He said, no, no, keep the booties on. Their texture makes them ideal for the purpose. And that's it. And then he said something I couldn't hear because his face was pressed into the carpet. What was that, Mr Dunderdale? I said. Excellent, Miss Fossard. I said, I'm anxious not to hurt you, Mr Dunderdale. He said, have no fear on that score, Miss Fossard. I said... I feel like one of those French peasants treading grapes. He said, yes, yes, yes. I said, do you feel the benefit? He said, yes, yes, I do. Thank you. If you don't mind, Miss Fossard, I'll just lie here for a little while. Perhaps you could see yourself out. So I just left him on the hearth rug. When I got back, Brother Bernard is sitting on the sofa with Miss Malloy, both of them looking a bit red in the face. We were just laughing, Miss Malloy says, because Bernard couldn't think of a word. Well, when he can't manage a word, I said, as Mr Clarkson Hall suggested, 
he must learn to skirt round it. Oh, he did that all right, she said, and they both burst out laughing. Mr Clarkson Hall's very pleased with him. Says he's never known a recovery so quick. Says he didn't have the privilege of knowing Bernard before his cerebral accident. But he imagines he's quite like his old self and I said yes, he is. Note from Mr Dunderdale this morning saying his back is much better and that he was looking forward to seeing me next week. Estelle suffers in the back department. The legacy from once having to wield a spare pike at the Battle of Naseby. So I was telling her all about me helping Mr Dunderdale with his, only she wasn't grateful. Just giggles and says, ooh, still waters. Floor coverings. They ought to have somebody more mature. She really belongs in cosmetics. I want to finish up tonight with two more of Donal's poems and then a little piece of music that I had a hand in writing. This piece came about thanks to a magical little project called Son de Mujer, A Woman's Sound. A project with two singers, Tessa and Ava, guitarist Cy Williams and percussionist, well, you know who, very well in order to shine a light on the artistry of women in music, the composers, the arrangers, the producers, as well as the performers. Tessa Estevez and I have maintained a strong friendship ever since, and it is thanks to her that I got to record a magnificent version of this song on her album, A Dos Bandas, a link to which you will find in the comments, so please, please do go look for that. On the recorded version, both Tessa and I sing. The guitar is provided by Cy, Robbie and Howard from Track Dogs on percussion and trumpet, respectively. The song was put together to celebrate International Women's Day a couple of years ago. And while the musical composition is basically mine, Arranged with the help of all these musicians, it is really a showcase of the extraordinary poem written by Maya Angelou. Phenomenal woman. Her words. Tonight, I want to perform a version of the song accompanied on this very special occasion via audio track by my sister, Juliette Lewis, on tenor sax, and of course, Robbie K. Jones. I dedicate this song to all the phenomenal women in my life, and particularly to my mum, my sister Juliet, and to Tessa. Do please leave a comment for me below, for good or ill. And thank you so much for watching. Ring cycle. Just phone, that's all. Call. Ring to say that you're not ringing tonight, that's all right. Just phone. Re wounds. My iPod has betrayed me, played my music to you but judiciously recorded bits of our being together time without my noticing. Now, when I press play, each note carries your perfume. Each beat is your pulse. Between bars, I hear our big time small talk. Your ambitions. My options. You are in every song now. No MP3 is free. Orchestras of you. You B40. You too. You in jazz. Choirs of you, you, you in my music. When I ask my iTunes for a me tune without pausing, 
It replies with replays of the love I once believed in. And the sort you can't erase.
okay? What do you think? I think it's all right.